Joseph. I'm an associate of the Institute for the Humanities. So, as you know, we're, we're here to listen to John Holloway. And uh, John Holloway is a, a Marxist-oriented scholar. Uh, he's considered by many to be more Marxist autonomous in outlook. Uh, he was born in Dublin and received his PhD in the University of Edinburgh. And he moved to Mexico in 1991, where he wrote two of his most influential books, which I'm sure everyone's very familiar with, uh, that's Changed the World Without Taking Power and Crack Capitalism. Uh, his work is widely debated in Marxist and anarchist circles and has been taken up by activists and academics in various anti-globalization struggles. Uh, I would say that this certainly puts him in the category of, of historical figure as his ideas have no doubt have had consequence for many movements around the globe. Um, he currently teaches at the Autonomous University of Puebla at the Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences where he focuses primarily on working with graduate level students. Um, I was personally politicized by the Occupy movement, and during that time, uh, John Bogardis came to one of our meetings with some fudge, and <laughs> I, I, took, I took his ethnography class, and I ended up kind of doing a, an ethnography on my experiences at Occupy, and he passed on to me a copy of Crap Capitalism, which at the time I kind of referred to as the anarchist bible, so I know for myself, at least, uh, John Holloway has been hugely influential. He casts a shadow over all of my work. And I'm sure, I, well, I know for a fact that I speak for a few people here when I say that uh, his, his work is very, very hugely influential and continues to be. All right, John, it's all you. Okay. Right. <laughs> thank, thank, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks, and be, uh, thanks as well to, to John Bogardus, who has really turned the meeting, I don't know when it was, but we met about five or six years ago, into a regular contact um, between me and Simon Fraser, which has just been lovely over the years. Thanks to you all for coming. Thanks to, to the people you can't see at this end. Thanks to Edgar, who's supporting us. Um, technically here, and to a number of my students who've come along. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I suppose, I hope the sound is okay, is it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. I suppose I feel, I mean, I've done talk by Skype before, but I don't, I'm never quite sure how to do it. I always feel that I'm learning. Because for you, obviously, I'm just an image on the screen. And that would make it more difficult to establish a relationship um, between us. No, so please, please be patient. And yeah, as I said, I don't, I don't quite know how to do it. What I've done this time is to write out my talk. So I've got a text here in front of me that I'm going to more or less read. Now, I don't know whether that's a good idea or not. The reason I did that, I think, was partly because I want, in fact, what, what I'm going to say is kind of some, is a trial. It's a new experiment. It isn't, it isn't quite the same. It's almost the same as what I always say, but not quite the same as what I always say. So, um, it's, so that's why I wanted to write it out. And also I wanted to write it out because it's, I'm really going to talk about my current obsession, um, and it's my current obsession or my current worry or my current, I don't know, my, it's what's bugging me actually at the moment. Now. And I'm also te teaching a course on it. Um, I'm teaching a master's course here called Hope and Crisis, which we've just started about two, three weeks ago. So the idea is that the talk should also help me. So if the fact that I'm reading or half reading makes it all very boring, then the best thing to do is to interrupt me. To interrupt me as often as you like and interrupt me by either just by questions or by booing or heckling, <laughs> by worse bursting into prolonged uproarious applause. <laughs> perfectly free to do that. The other thing is that I've changed the title a little bit. 
or at least I've given this a second title. Um, the paper is now called Think Hope, Think Crisis. Think Hope, Think Crisis, Think Hope and Crisis. And I mean this really as a challenge, a challenge to you and a challenge to me and a challenge to all of us. Think hope, think crisis, think hope and crisis. And first, think hope. Ernst Bloch, a German Jew exiled in the United States during the Second World War, returned to Germany and proclaimed, proclaimed at the beginning of his great work, the principle of hope. Now is the time to learn hope. That was 60 years ago, and much has happened since then to make us realize just how difficult it is, how difficult it is to maintain the hope that another world is possible, a radically different one, a world that would not be ruled by money, a world that would not be characterized by all the obscene injustice and destruction that the rule of money brings with it. Bloch, when he returned to Germany, he chose to settle in the communist ruled East Germany. And he saw the possibility, at that time, he saw the possibility of realizing this hope for a better world in terms of the strength of the communist parties, though he later realized his mistake. And now, we're in a very different situation. The party is over. There are no communist parties that we could seriously associate with hope for a radically different future. There are no communist parties and there are no other political parties either. Political parties, in the very best of cases, make small changes that might be good. But no political party even mentions the possibility of breaking the power of capital, of breaking the power of money. And yet, hope for a different world has not disappeared. I don't think it can disappear because it grows out of rage. It grows out of the rage that we feel when we hear that the 85 richest people in the world own the same wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion, that is, half the population of the earth, as an Oxfam report published last week informs us. It grows out of the frustration we feel when we realize that it is likely that we will be forced to spend much of our lives doing things that we would not choose to do. It grows out of the scream of no when we see the mining companies, the mining companies, and above all the Canadian mining companies, destroying communities and tearing up the earth in to increase their profits. Rage, hope, call it what you will. It's usually a mixture of both, in fact. Rage and hope, hoping rage. Or, as the Zapatistas put it, dignified rage. It is always a refusal to accept a ya basta enough that pushes beyond, that projects us beyond to a different world. So, no, hope has not disappeared. It is no longer attached to a party, but it is in us and all around us, around us. It explodes and lights up the sky like the riots in Turkey and Brazil and Sweden and Bulgaria last year, one after another after another like a great global display of fireworks. And sometimes it is not these great explosions but other more settled shinings of hope around us like the Zapatistas who've been constructing the world of dignity now, the world of rebellion and dignity for more than 20 years. Or the many, many, many experiments and projects 
of trying to break the logic of capital, trying to live in a different way that exists throughout the world. So hope is there all around us. But somehow, and I suppose this is what worries me, or it's part of what worries me, somehow I feel that it doesn't have the same confidence or perhaps the same sense of direction as it had 50 or 60 years ago when Bloch was writing. The communist hope of the first half of the last century may have been misfounded or misguided in many respects, but it had a solidity. And perhaps we can see the last half of the 20th century as a great disillusion, a great disappointment, a loss of hope, the consequences of which still affect the way we think and we act. The fall of the Soviet Union, the rise of China, but as a capitalist power, the failure of the revolutionary movements in Latin America and Africa, as well to the outcome of the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, which created a formally equal society, but one which is at the same time, in fact, the most unequal society in the world. So everywhere, a loss of hope. And this loss of hope, of course, it's a personal pain. But it's also a shrinking of the world and the shrinking of the mind. The world is reduced to that which is. Forget your dreams. Forget the world as it might be. Forget the world that we could create against and beyond that which exists now. Against and beyond the world ruled by money, ruled by capital. Forget all that. Forget it. Just focus on what is. That is what the universities tell us, isn't it? That's what the whole system of education tells us. Forget your hopes. Leave them outside when you come into the classroom. If you want to keep them, then fine. Take them to the church on Sunday. Or take them to the shopping mall, if you like. Hope for a new dress or a new car. But do not think that you can actually think hope rationally. Do not think that there is any real possibility of a different world. That is what we are told all the time. And when we say think hope, and when we say that is a challenge, that is a challenge to you and to us, we reject that. We are saying that the center of where we are, where I am in this moment and where you are, the center of the university, the center of the work of each and all of us must be to think hope, to think and of course to practice the possibility of creating a new world against and beyond the obscenity in which we live. And that is why I want to go back to Bloch. That is why I think it is important to go back to his, state, to his statement that now is the time to learn hope. To learn hope, not just to hope. Anyone can hope. But what we need is what Bloch called a doctor space a learned or grounded hope. Bloch showed us the way in many respects by showing the force of hope, of that pushing against and beyond, that against and beyond that which is throughout history and in all great expressions of art, music, religion, even fairy tales. But now I think it is a question not just of learning hope, but of relearning hope, relearning it after the great disillusion. 
learning after the great dissolution and also learning from the great dissolution because the great dissolution of the last half of the last century is not only a loss of hope it is also the discarding of illusions the learning from mistakes and that is what the movements of revolt and pro protest are doing throughout the world and that I think is what we are or should be doing as part of those movements. And what is it that we are learning? We are learning, I suppose one obvious thing that we're learning is no, no to leaders, no to hierarchical structures. We're learning that the way to radical change does not lie through the state it does not lie through political parties no the leaders and no the hierarchies because the world we want is not a world of leaders but a world based on the mutual recognition of each and all no to leaders because the revolution revolution is simply a movement by which we ourselves assume our responsibility for life on earth. Know then to revolution as a great event. Revolution is here and now. We create the world we want by living it. It is here and now. It exists already as millions and millions of revolts, of misfittings, of people who either do not have the possibility to fit into the system or who consciously decide that they do not want to. These can be seen as cracks in the system of domination, as I suggest in the book Crack Capitalism. They are, if you like, eruptions of the not yet of a world that does not yet exist, but exists already as not yet, as project, as dream, as struggle. They are explosions of the latent, of that which lies hidden under the surface, creations of a different world, potentially. Perhaps instead of thinking of the communist revolution as the great event that would transform the world at a stroke we are learning to think of revolution the multiplicity of communizing of communal or collective appropriations of the world there is a real process of learning from the great disillusion a relearning of hope a recreation of, a, of hope there is, I think, a communizing that is underway. But, but it's not enough. It's not enough, is it? That's what hurts in a way. That's, that, that's why we have to think. That's why we have to learn. It's not enough. Because capital has a tremendous capacity to enforce its own logic to support and subordinate all to the logic of money and this is nowhere more dramatically illustrated at the moment than in Greece the drastic austerity measures imposed by the government over the last few years under pressure from the European Union and the IMF and of course and above all the money markets has been opposed by what is probably the strongest, most militant left in Europe, both autonomous anarchists left and also party organized Communist Party tradition left. Massive demonstrations, massive civil dis disobedience, the burning of what, 20, 30 buildings in the center of the city a couple of years ago creation of alternatives and the governments don't listen they simply do not listen they go on with the measures that have reduced living standards drastically 
created and created massive unemployment and insecurity. Enormous creative disobedience on our side. And capital just goes on trampling all over us, saying, obey, 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 because there is no other way. Capital is daring us. Capital is laughing at us. An evil, mocking man. So much for your fancy ideas of revolution and justice in this world. Don't you know that money is all powerful? If you want to carry on with your stupidities about radical change, you must go away and think, 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 because your ideas are just not good enough. And that, I think, is what we must do. Think, 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 and act, act, act. And give up any notion that we have the answers because we don't. Bloch had an idea Bloch had this, this idea that always seemed to me slightly, slightly strange. But now I can feel I want to come back to it and explore it. Here, uh, the, the hoping subject had to find hope within the object. In other words, within the object that the subject wants to change. That the hoping subject had to discover the movement of hope within the object. In other words, if we want to change the world, we have to meet a world that is changeable. Marx saw the changeability of the world, the possibility of overcoming capitalism, in terms of crisis. Of cri in crisis, capital is confronted with its own mortality. It comes up against its own limits. Of crisis, he says, and I quote, it comes to the surface here in a purely economic way that capital has its barrier, barrier, that it is relative, that it is not an absolute, but only a historical mode of production corresponding to a definite limited epoch in the development of the material requirements of production. Think crisis, then. Thinking hope leads us to the need to think crisis. Crisis is the moment of maximum fragility of capitalism, the moment of greatest transparency, when it becomes clear that it is a form of social organization that has failed, that does not work, that simply is unable to secure the reproduction of a large part of the world's population. A system that is destroying the basis of human existence. Crisis is the concentration of hope, the moment at which our subjective longing for a different world confronts a system that is crying out to be replaced, that is, dis that is displaying to all its own inadequacies, that it's declaring its own bankruptcy. Think hope, think crisis. But as soon as we put them together, we see that it doesn't work like that. We are in the middle, it's like being in the middle of a romantic film, filled with the most agonizing suspense. There are two main characters in this film. We are one of them, the romantic lead, of course. We our hope and struggle. We, the process of communizing. We, the workers, creators of the world. And we are desperately in love with the other main character, the changeability of the world, the crisis of capital, the fragility of the system. We know, we know perfectly well, we've read it over and over again, that we are destined for each other. 
that we must come together and that when we do, a new world will open. But somehow, every time we meet our loved one, something goes wrong. The magic of true love just does not come to pass. We are kept in suspense. Will the two sides ever come together? If it were a Hollywood or perhaps Bollywood film, we could be confident of a happy ending. But since it's real life, we know that we'll end in absolute tragedy, the total destruction of humanity. We have failed once already. We didn't manage to do it. We didn't. We were all communists and anti-capitalists and furious. In the last great crisis, the crisis of the 1930s, we, in a broad sense, and the the capitalism was so obviously a crisis, and somehow. We didn't fail. We didn't, we, we didn't manage it. We failed to make the trick work. We failed to make our love come to pass. And our failure led to the death of what? A hundred million people? Failure now would quite possibly mean that there would just be nobody around who could plant the number of bodies. And the problem, the problem with our love story, the problem, I think, is that, we, that this character we know is destined for us. Crisis, fragility, changeability. This character is two-faced. Crisis has two antithetical faces, faces turned against each other, battling with, with each other. That is the original meaning of crisis, a potential turning point you know, that could go either way. In medicine, it is that stage in illness at which a patient may recur or may turn towards death. Capital comes up against its limits. It may succeed in restructuring its command over the world and recovering, or it may not. We know which side we are on. We want capital to die. Or perhaps we want to just push it aside and create a new world that goes against and beyond that which exists. Of course, we could take the side of restructuring and try to bend it in our favour. I mean, I think that's what a large part of the left actually does. I think that's probably what the the, the state-centred left does. But I think the problem is that I don't think there is any restructuring in our favour that is actually possible at the moment. And I don't think that there is any restructuring of capital that can stop the dynamic of destruction of the conditions of our own existence. So it seems to me much simpler to say, fine, this is a turning point. We want to have to decide whether capital, we want capital to go on or whether we want it to die. And it is simply much simpler, more honest to say in this moment of crisis, that's it. Thank you, capital. You've had your day. Kindly place yourself in the dustbin of history and let us get on with the task of constructing a world that is good to live in. So crisis is a battle between its own two faces. Crisis as restructuring and crisis as rupture and opening. And that is surely the battle that is being fought out in the streets of Athens, or of Madrid, of Istanbul, of Rio de Janeiro, of a battle that is being fought out in the universities, the universities of Canada and Britain and Mexico and all the world. A battle that has been fought out in every factory and every office and every home. Obviously, 
we do not stand outside the crisis. We are at its centre. We are in the crisis, and the crisis in our, is in us. And the universities, in a way, I suppose, are at the heart of the crisis because they're at, at the heart of the restructuring process, simply because the restructuring of capital means the restructuring of people, of what we do and what we ca are capable of doing. In everything we do, every class we take, every essay we write, we are at the centre of the restructuring. As we are told, this is what you must learn. And we reply, no, no, sorry, the agenda has changed. And now the only scientific question that is left to us is how do we pull the emergency brake before we all go for the cliff? Or in other words, how do we reconstruct the world on a different basis against and beyond the rule of money? And at times, it all seems just impossible. It seems that crisis is restructuring, and restructuring in a very, very nasty way is winning hands down. Look at Greece, look at Spain, look at anywhere you want to look at. At times, it seems that it is, it is even offensive to link hope to crisis when what crisis means for so many people is unemployment, poverty, depression. And yet, somehow I think we have to. We have to think hope, think crisis. We have to, if we are not to reduce our dreams to the world that is, if we are not to accept the dynamic of destruction which currently rules the world. But how? How can we keep open the perspective of crisis as rupture? And I think the basis has to be the patient, often invisible, but sometimes very impatient and indeed very visible process of negation and creation. The refusal to accept and the creation of something else, the practicalist domination. But I think what is also important is to think crisis differently. In order to turn the world upside down in practice, we must also turn it upside down in our own minds. To think hope, we cannot start from domination. We cannot start from ourselves as victims. I suppose that's what I hate most, actually. Well, no, that's an exaggeration. Um, but I really dislike the kind of theorizing sort of talk about capitalism that starts out from domination. Because sometimes people have the idea that to say that capitalism is a nasty system of domination is in some sense left-wing or revolutionary or progressive, and I think it's not at all. I think it's actually the most obvious thing in the world that's hardly worth saying. And the problem with starting out with domination is that then we lock ourselves into a frame of mind where it's very difficult to move beyond depression, where it's very difficult to move beyond being victims. And I suppose that's part of what I'm saying with trying to say, when I say think hope, break with that. We have to put ourselves where we are, and that is in the centre of the world. We have to start with ourselves as subjects, and to understand that the key to understanding the weakness of any system is that the rulers depend on the ruled. The master depends on the servant. Without the servant, he does not know how to wash his clothes or to cook his food. This was a theme in Lavoisier's discourse on voluntary servitude in the 16th century. But it's a theme that then becomes more, much more prominent in the literature that leads up to the French Revolution, as in Beaumarchais's Marriage of Figaro, for example. And it's also a theme in Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit, 
with its dialectic of master and servant. And then it seems to me it acquires a central place in Marx's capital with his labor theory of value. Because what the labor theory of value tells us is that capital is nothing other than the expropriation and, the appropri and accumulation of products of our labor. In other words, capital depends absolutely on us, on our labor. Capital depends on its capacity to oblige us to act in a certain way each day, on its capacity to oblige us to perform abstract or alienated labor, labor in the service of capital. And what if we all decided that today and tomorrow and the day after, we will not dedicate ourselves to producing capital? What if we all decided that, no, we're not going to do that, we're going to go out and play, or we're going to spend it in bed, or we're going to go and dance in the streets? Then we would stop making capital, and if we stopped making capital, then there would be no capitalism. And perhaps, perhaps it's not quite so simple, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but I think it does make us think that we shouldn't take capital for granted. We think, usually, that the capitalists have it easy. But perhaps we need to turn our thoughts upside down and think, no, no, it's not like that, really. Poor capitalists, poor capitalists, they have to find a way of obliging the population of the world that rather than just doing what they want, like going out and playing or dancing in the streets, they should devote their lives to producing capital so that the capitalists can get richer and richer and more and more powerful. And we think it's obvious and it's not obvious. And if you're a parent, for example, if you're a parent of small children, then you probably know how difficult it can be to take the children to the park to play and then say at the end, of the, no, it's time to stop the fun, time to go home. And the children say, no! And they scream and they want to stay playing. <laughs> They were just talking of what, two or three of them, and they love you. Then <laughs> imagine, imagine how difficult it is for capital to say to not just two or three, but to millions and millions of people, millions and millions of people who certainly do not love them, every single day. Now it's time to stop the fun, time to go home. Time to stop doing what you want to do. It's time to go to work and produce riches for us so that we can increase our control over you and over the world. They manage it, of course, through their control of the means of production and living and with more than a little bit of help from the education system and, of course, from the police. But don't be surprised if they complain that how difficult it is. And do not be surprised if they come into crisis just because we are just too stupid or stubborn to do what they require of us. In fact, the life of capitalists is even more difficult than that. It's actually much more difficult than that. Because the real difficulty is not only that they have to oblige us to work, but that they have to oblige us to work faster, 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 harder, 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 more and more efficiently. They cannot stand still. They cannot produce today in the same way as they produced yesterday. And they cannot let us have a quiet life. Marx expresses this by saying that what determines the quantity of value of a commodity is the socially necessary labor time required to produce it. And this will tend to fall all the time as we acquire the ability to produce things 
more and more quickly. Of course, this is achieved partly through the introduction of machinery, but that just displaces the problem because that imposes on the capitalist the necessity to exploit the work workers sufficiently to pay for the cost of the machinery. This creates what Marx calls the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, which basically says that the progressive introduction of machinery will lead to a fall in the rate of profit unless the capitalists can increase the exploit workers proportionately. And conversely then, we can say that if the rate of profit falls, then this means that the capitalists are not succeed in the, succeeding in exploiting the workers sufficiently to compensate for the rising costs of machinery. And then, yes, the poor capitalists are in crisis. And it is our fault. It is our fault because we are too stupid, or too stubborn, or too ill-educated, or perhaps just too human to do what is demanded of us. It is our fault that capital comes into crisis, not just because we go on demonstrations, or go out and strike, or scream against the government. It is our fault because we do not want to work harder and harder and longer and longer. It is our fault because we think other things are important, like spending time with our loved ones, like playing with our children or relaxing from time to time. It is our fault that capital is in crisis. Or as Alan Greenspan, the former head of the US Federal Reserve, said of the crisis in Greece and Spain, it is a cultural problem. <laughs> In other words, the Greeks and the Spanish have not yet learned to work hard enough. They have not yet subordinated themselves sufficiently to the values of capitalism. They have a cultural problem. And what do we say when they say, then, when they say, as they do say, that the crisis of our fault, we must and must and must say, yes, that's quite, quite right. It is our fault. We are the crisis of capital. And do you know what? We are proud of it. We are proud of it. Firstly, because our refusal to buy bow low, our refusal to subordinate every aspect of our lives to capital, our refusal to become robots, is our humanity, our dignity. And secondly, we are proud to be the crisis of capital because capitalism is a system that stinks to high heaven that is well past its sell-by date. So enough of saying that the crisis is the fault of the capitalists. The very notion, it seems to me, is absurd and humiliating that blames our masters for not ruling over us effectively enough. Now, what are we saying when we say, oh, it's the fault of the capitalists? We're saying, oh, they should be more efficient capitalists. They should do it better. They should dominate us better. Why don't they exploit us better? <laughs> and that locks us into a scheme of thought that calls for a return to capitalist normality, that the crisis is the capitalist fault. Why don't we get back to normality, to capitalist normality, to a normality that probably cannot come back, cannot return, and if it did return, would simply lead to renewed crisis and continued destruction of the world. So much better then to say with pride, we are the crisis of your stupid system. We are the dignity that will give rise to a new world. We are the only hope for humanity. Or, to quote from a song by Linton Crazy Johnson that keep, keeps on coming back to me, we're the forces of victory and we're coming right through. We're the forces of victory. Now what are you going to do? 
Well, what are you going to do then, capital? What are you going to do, capital, confronted by our strength? In a way, we know what they're going to do because they're already doing it. Firstly, an outright attack to break our resistance, to force us to bow low everywhere, legislation to limit the power of trade unions, everywhere, stagnant or falling real wages for most workers, everywhere, reform of the educational system to make it more directly subordinate to the requirements of capital, everywhere, cutbacks on welfare provision and the attempt to subordinate every aspect of life to the rule of money, everywhere an increase in police repression to break protest. That is one part of what capitalist restructuring means. And yet that is not enough for capital. That is not enough to solve the problems of capital. And I think the reason we know that it is not enough is because the direct attack is accompanied by an ever-growing fiction. Let's pretend, capital says to itself, if we cannot succeed in subordinating the world sufficiently to maintain our products, let's pretend that we can. If we cannot get enough surplus value out of the worker, We'll pretend that it is there. We'll create money. We'll create debt. We'll create a whole world of fiction in the hope that tomorrow we'll be able to create the necessary basis by making the workers more productive. But in fact, as that tomorrow never comes, and so the game of make-believe keeps on being and growing, going on and on. And over the last 40 years, that game of fiction has given rise to a whole world of finance that then develops its own dynamic that is outside anybody's control and that has led to the whole series of financial crises that we've seen over the last decade and the near collapse of the whole system in September 2008 with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Bank. Capital may seem very strong and invisible, but its strength skates on thin ice. Its strength is very much based on the world of fiction, which they too recognize can very easily collapse. And what if there is a collapse? Does financial collapse open ground for hope for us there is a passage in a book written by Anna-Li Pietz 30 years ago, in fact, that puts the problem very nicely. He says that he has been haunted by an image since the crisis began. The image of a cartoon character who has gone over the edge of a cliff and carries on walking on thin air. This seems to me, he says, to illustrate the position of the world economy which continues to work on credit while the actual growth on which post on which the sorry, the actual yeah, growth um, on which post war growth has been based crumbles beneath it. And I think that was in nineteen eighty three that he, he wrote that. In fact the the, 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 the the scale of debt has increased enormously since then. The question for us is what do we want? Do we want the cartoon character to carry on maintaining capitalism aloft? Or do we want it to come tumbling down? I think we want it definitely to come tumbling down and that may well happen quite independently of whatever what we want. But to avoid total disaster we must be aware that we would not be the victims of the collapse, but its subjects. That the collapse would result from capital's inability to master us sufficiently for its purposes. And secondly, it would not, to avoid total disaster, 
we must be as prepared as possible in terms of creating the conditions for material survival independent of the flow of money. A financial collapse would be the most manifest, most dramatic manifestation of capitalism's failure. But perhaps there is one thing that is emerging from the crisis. It's one thing that we should hold on to, and that I think is the widespread <coughs> perception that capitalism is a failure. People may not use the revolution, but I think it's becoming more and more clear that capitalism is a failure, that whether it ever did work, it does not work now. It is creating enormous unemployment, growing disparities of wealth and poverty, increasing violence, the destruction of nature, the real threat of financial collapse. And perhaps people find it hard to see alternatives or to think beyond the immediate problems of survival. But I feel that over all our struggles and everything we do, we should raise a banner that says capitalism is a failure, a failure, a failure. Or perhaps more politely, goodbye capital. It was not very nice to know you. And now the time has come for you to go. We are building something new. Goodbye capital and capitalists. Goodbye state and politicians. It is time for you to go because now we are going to assume our own responsibility for the world. Is this the answer? No. It's a nice ending for the talk. <laughs> but the search, the search for an answer goes on. And I think the agony remains. Now, what can we do? What can we do to transform the world? What can we do to realize the age-old hope of a society based on the mutual recognition of human dignity. What can we do to stop this disaster? Think hope, think crisis, and thank you very much.